Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly. And off we go. Before we begin, I'd like to give a shout out of thanks to new Patreon supporters, Mitchell, Candice, and William. Thank you so much to all of you for supporting this podcast. You help make it possible, and it's much appreciated. If you are interested in learning about the perks available to Patreon supporters, including exclusive episodes heard nowhere else, You'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. Now, let's get to the reading. Tonight, we head back into history with an account of Egypt by Herodotus, translated by George Campbell Macaulay in 1890. Let's begin. Note. Herodotus was born at Halicarnassus, on the southwest coast of Asia Minor, in the early part of the 5th century BC. Of his life, we know almost nothing, except that he spent much of it traveling to collect the material for his writings, and that he finally settled down at Thurii in southern Italy, where his great work was composed. He died in 424 BC. The subject of the history of Herodotus is the struggle between the Greeks and the barbarians, which he brings down to the Battle of Mycale in 479 BC. The work as we have it is divided into nine books, named after the nine muses, but this division is probably due to the Alexandrine grammarians. His information he gathered mainly from oral sources, as he traveled through Asia Minor, down into Egypt, round the Black Sea, and into various parts of Greece and the neighboring countries. The chronological narrative halts from time to time to give opportunity for descriptions of the country, the people, and their customs and previous history, and the political account is constantly varied by rare tales and wonders. Among these descriptions of countries, the most fascinating to the modern, as it was to the ancient reader, is his account of the marvels of the land of Egypt. From the priests at Memphis, Heliopolis, and the Egyptian Thebes, he learned what he reports of the size of the country, the wonders of the Nile, the ceremonies of their religion, the sacredness of their animals. He tells also of the strange ways of the crocodile, and of that marvelous bird, the phoenix, of dress and funerals and embalming, of the eating of lotus and papyrus, of the pyramids and the great labyrinth, of their kings and queens and courtesans. Yet Herodotus is not a mere teller of strange tales. However credulous he may appear to a modern judgment, he takes care to keep separate what he knows by his own observation from what he has merely inferred and from what he has been told. He is candid about acknowledging ignorance, and when versions differ, he gives both. Thus, the modern scientific historian, with other means of corroboration, can sometimes learn from Herodotus more than Herodotus himself knew. There is abundant evidence, too, that Herodotus had a philosophy of history. The unity which marks his work is due not only to the strong Greek national feeling running through it, the feeling that rises to a height in such passages as the descriptions of the battles of Marathon, Thermopylae, and Salamis, but also to his profound belief in fate and in nemesis. To his belief in fate, 
is due the frequent quoting of oracles and their fulfillment, the frequent references to things foreordained by providence. The workings of Nemesis he finds in the disasters that befall men and nations, whose towering prosperity awakens the jealousy of the gods. The final overthrow of the Persians, which forms his main theme, is only one specially conspicuous example of the operation of this force from which human life can never free itself. But above all, he is the father of storytellers. Herodotus is such simple and delightful reading, says Jevons. He is so unaffected and entertaining. His story flows so naturally and with such ease that we have a difficulty in bearing in mind that over and above the hard writing which goes to make easy reading, there is a perpetual marvel in the work of Herodotus. It is the first artistic work in prose that Greek literature produced. This prose work, which for pure literary merit no subsequent work has surpassed, than which later generations, after using the pen for centuries, have produced no prose more easy or more readable. This was the first of histories and of literary prose. An Account of Egypt by Herodotus, being the second book of his histories called Euterpe. When Cyrus had brought his life to an end, Cambyses received the royal power in succession, being the son of Cyrus and of Cassandine, the daughter of Pharnaspus, for whose death, which came about before his own, Cyrus had made great mourning himself, and also had proclaimed to all those over whom he bore rule that they should make mourning for her. Cambyses, I say, being the son of this woman and of Cyrus, regarded the Ionians and the Aeolians as slaves inherited from his father, and he proceeded to march an army against Egypt, taking with him his helpers, not only other nations of which he was ruler, but also those of the Hellenes over whom he had power besides. Now the Egyptians, before the time when Samatikos became king over them, were wont to suppose that they had come into being first of all men. But since the time when Samatikos, having become king, desired to know what men had come into being first, they supposed that the Phrygians came into being before themselves, but they themselves before all other men. Now Samatikos, when he was not able by inquiry to find out any means of knowing who had come into being first of all men, contrived a device of the following kind. Taking two newborn children belonging to persons of the common sort, he gave them to a shepherd to bring up at a place where his flocks were, with a manner of bringing up such as I shall say, charging him namely that no man should utter any word in their presence, and that they should be placed by themselves in a room where none might come, and at the proper time he should bring them she-goats, and when he had satisfied them with milk, he should do for them whatever else was needed. These things Samatikos did, and gave him this charge, wishing to hear what word the children would let break forth first, after they had ceased from wailings without sense. And accordingly it came to pass, for after a space of two years had gone by, during which the shepherd went on acting so, at length, when he opened the door and entered, both children fell before him in entreaty and uttered the word, Bekos, stretching forth their hands. And first when he heard this, the shepherd kept silence. But since this word was often repeated as he visited them constantly and attended to them, at last he declared the matter to his master, and at his command he brought the children before his face. 
Then Samatikos, having himself also heard it, began to inquire what nation of men named anything Bekos. And inquiring, he found that the Phrygians had this name for bread. In this manner, and guided by an indication such as this, the Egyptians were brought to allow that the Phrygians were a more ancient people than themselves. That so it came to pass, I heard from the priests of that Hephaestus who dwells at Memphis. But the Hellenes relate, besides many other idle tales, that Samatikos cut out the tongues of certain women, and then caused the children to live with these women. With regard, then, to the rearing of the children, they related so much as I have said, and I heard also other things at Memphis, when I had speech with the priests of Hephaestus. Moreover, I visited both Thebes and Heliopolis for this very cause, namely because I wished to know whether the priests at these places would agree in their accounts with those at Memphis. For the men of Heliopolis are said to be the most learned in records of the Egyptians. Those of their narrations which I heard with regard to the gods, I am not earnest to relate in fall. But I shall name them only because I consider that all men are equally ignorant of these matters, and whatever things of them I may record, I shall record only because I am compelled by the course of my story. But as to those matters which concern men, the priests agreed with one another in saying that the Egyptians were the first of all men on earth to find out the course of the year, having divided the seasons into twelve parts to make up the whole. And this they said they found out from the stars. And they reckoned to this extent more wisely than the Hellenes, as it seems to me, inasmuch as the Hellenes throw in an intercalated month every other year to make the seasons right. Whereas the Egyptians, reckoning the twelve months as thirty days each, bring in also every year five days beyond number, and thus the circle of their season is completed and comes round to the same point whence it set out. They said, moreover, that the Egyptians were the first who brought into use appellations for the twelve gods, and the Hellenes took up the use from them, and that they were the first who assigned altars and images and temples to the gods, and who engraved figures on stones. And with regard to the greater number of these things, they showed me by actual facts that they had happened so. They said also that the first man who became king of Egypt was Min, and that in his time all Egypt except the district of Thebes was a swamp, and none of the regions were then above water, which now lie below the lake of Moiris, to which lake it is a voyage of seven days up the river from the sea. And I thought that they said well about the land, for it is manifest in truth, even to a person who has not heard it beforehand, but has only seen, at least if he have understanding, that the Egypt to which the Hellenes come in ships is a land which has been won by the Egyptians as an addition, and that it is a gift of the river. Moreover, the regions which lie above this lake also for a distance of three days' sail about which they did not go on to say anything of this kind, are nevertheless another instance of the same thing. For the nature of the land of Egypt is as follows. First, when you are still approaching it in a ship and are distant a day's run from the land, if you let down a sounding line, you will bring up mud, and you will find yourself in eleven fathoms, this then so far shows that there is a silting forward of the land. Then secondly, as to Egypt itself, the extent of it along the sea is sixty scoines, according to our definition of Egypt as extending from the Gulf of Plinthine 
to the Serbonian Lake, along which stretches Mount Cassian. From this lake, then, the sixty Scoines are reckoned. For those of men who are poor in land have their country measured by fathoms, those who are less poor by furlongs, those who have much land by parasangs, and those who have land in very great abundance by Scoines. Now the parasang is equal to thirty furlongs, and each Scoine, which is an Egyptian measure, is equal to sixty furlongs. So there would be an extent of three thousand six hundred furlongs for the coastland of Egypt. From thence and as far as Heliopolis inland, Egypt is broad, and the land is all flat and without springs of water and formed of mud. From Heliopolis, however, as you go up, Egypt is narrow, for on the one side a mountain range belonging to Arabia stretches along by the side of it, going in a direction from the north towards the midday and the south wind, tending upwards without a break to that which is called the Erythrean Sea, in which range are the stone quarries which were used in cutting stone for the pyramids at Memphis. On this side, then, the mountain ends where I have said, and then takes a turn back, and where it is widest, as I was informed, it is a journey of two months across from east to west, and the borders of it which turn towards the east are said to produce frankincense. Such, then, is the nature of this mountain range. And on the side of Egypt towards Libya another range extends, rocky and enveloped in sand. In this are the pyramids, and it runs in the same direction as those parts of the Arabian mountains which go towards the midday. So then I say, from Heliopolis the land has no longer a great extent so far as it belongs to Egypt, and for about four days' sail up the river, Egypt properly so called is narrow. After this again, Egypt is broad. Such is the nature of this land, and from Heliopolis to Thebes is a voyage up the river of nine days, and the distance of this journey in furlongs is four thousand eight hundred and sixty, the number of Scoines being eighty-one. The priests also gave me a strong proof concerning this land as follows, namely that in the reign of King Moiris, whenever the river reached a height of at least eight cubits, it watered Egypt below Memphis, and not yet nine hundred years had gone by since the death of Moiris, when I heard these things from the priests. Now, however, unless the river rises to sixteen cubits, or fifteen at the least, it does not go over the land. I think, too, that those Egyptians who dwell below the lake of Moiris, and especially in that region which is called the Delta, if that land continues to grow in height according to this proportion, and to increase similarly in extent, will suffer for all remaining time from the Nile not overflowing their land. That same thing which they themselves said that the Hellenes would at some time suffer. For hearing that the whole land of the Hellenes has rain and is not watered by rivers as theirs is, they said that the Hellenes would at some time be disappointed of a great hope and would suffer the ills of famine. This saying means that if the god shall not send them rain, but shall allow drought to prevail for a long time, the Hellenes will be destroyed by hunger, for they have in fact no other supply of water to save them except from Zeus alone. This has been rightly said by the Egyptians with reference to the Hellenes, 
But now, let me tell how matters are with the Egyptians themselves in their turn. If, in accordance with what I before said, their land below Memphis, for this is that which is increasing, shall continue to increase in height, according to the same proportion as in the past, assuredly those Egyptians who dwell here will suffer famine, if their land shall not have rain nor the river be able to go over the fields. It is certain, however, that now they gather in fruit from the earth, with less labor than any other men, and also with less than the other Egyptians, for they have no labor in breaking up furrows with a plow, nor in hoeing, nor in any other of those labors which other men have about a crop. But when the river has come up of itself and watered their fields, and after watering has left them again, then each man sows his own field, and turns into it swine, and when he has trodden the seed into the ground by means of the swine, after that he waits for the harvest, and when he has threshed the corn by means of the swine, then he gathers it in. As regards the nature of the river, neither from the priests, nor yet from any other man, was I able to obtain any knowledge, and I was desirous especially to learn from them about these matters, namely why the Nile comes down, increasing in volume, from the summer solstice onwards for a hundred days, and then when it has reached the number of these days, turns and goes back, failing in its stream, so that through the whole winter season it continues to be low, and until the summer solstice returns. Of none of these things was I able to receive any account from the Egyptians, when I inquired of them what power the Nile has, whereby it is of a nature opposite to that of all other rivers. And I made inquiry, desiring to know both this which I say, and also why, unlike all other rivers, it does not give rise to any breezes blowing from it. However, some of the Hellenes who desire to gain distinction for cleverness have given an account of this water in three different ways. Two of these I do not think it worthwhile even to speak of, except only to indicate their nature, of which the one says that the Atesian winds are the cause that makes the river rise by preventing the Nile from flowing out into the sea. But often the Atesian winds fail, and yet the Nile does the same work as it is wont to do. And moreover, if these were the cause, all the other rivers which flow in a direction opposed to the Atesian winds ought to have been affected in the same way as the Nile, and even more, inasmuch as they are smaller and present to them a feebler flow of streams. But there are many of these rivers in Syria, and many also in Libya, and they are affected in no such manner as the Nile. The second way shows more ignorance than that which has been mentioned, and it is more marvelous to tell, for it says that the river produces these effects because it flows from the ocean, and that the ocean flows round the whole earth. The third of these ways is much the most specious, but nevertheless it is the most mistaken of all. For indeed, this way has no more truth in it than the rest, alleging as it does that the Nile flows from melting snow, whereas it flows out of Libya through the midst of the Ethiopians, and so comes out into Egypt. How then should it flow from snow, when it flows from the hottest parts to those which are cooler, and indeed most of the facts are such as to convince a man, one at least who is capable of reasoning about such matters, that it is not at all likely that it flows from snow. 
The first and greatest evidence is afforded by the winds, which blow hot from these regions. The second is that the land is rainless always and without frost, whereas after snow has fallen, rain must necessarily come within five days, so that if it snowed in those parts, rain would fall there. The third evidence is afforded by the people dwelling there, who are of a black color by reason of the burning heat. Moreover, kites and swallows remain there throughout the year and do not leave the land, and cranes flying from the cold weather which comes on in the region of Scythia come regularly to these parts for wintering. If then it snowed ever so little in that land through which the Nile flows, and in which it has its rise, none of these things would take place, as necessity compels us to admit. As for him who talked about the ocean, he carried his tail into the region of the unknown, and so he need not be refuted. Since I, for my part, know of no river ocean existing, but I think that Homer, or one of the poets who were before him, invented the name and introduced it into his verse. If, however, after I have found fault with the opinions proposed, I am bound to declare an opinion of my own about the matters which are in doubt, I will tell what to my mind is the reason why the Nile increases in the summer. In the winter season the sun, being driven away from his former path through the heaven by the stormy winds, comes to the upper parts of Libya. If one would set forth the matter in the shortest way, all has now been said. For whatever region this god approaches most and stands directly above, this, it may reasonably be supposed, is most in want of water, and its native streams of rivers are dried up most. However, to set it forth at greater length, thus it is. The sun, passing in his course by the upper parts of Libya, does thus, that is to say, since at all times the air in those parts is clear and the country is warm, because there are no cold winds. In passing through it, the sun does just as he was wont to do in the summer, when going through the midst of the heavens. That is, he draws to himself the water, and having drawn it, he drives it away to the upper parts of the country, and the winds take it up, and scattering it abroad, melt it into rain, so it is natural that the winds which blow from this region, namely the south and southwest winds, should be much the most rainy of all the winds. I think, however, that the sun does not send away from himself all the water of the Nile of each year, but that also he lets some remain behind with himself. Then, when the winter becomes milder, the sun returns back again to the midst of the heaven, and from that time onwards he draws equally from all rivers. But in the meantime they flow in large volume, since water of rain mingles with them in great quantity, because their country receives rain then, and is filled with torrent streams. In summer, however, they are weak, since not only the showers of rain fail them, but also they are drawn by the sun. The Nile, however, alone of all rivers, not having rain and being drawn by the sun, naturally flows during this time of winter in much less than its proper volume, that is, much less than in summer for then it is drawn equally with all the other waters, but in winter it bears the burden alone. Thus I suppose the sun to be the cause of these things. He also is the cause, in my opinion, that the air in these parts is dry, 
since he makes it so by scorching up his path through the heaven. Thus summer prevails always in the upper parts of Libya. If, however, the station of the seasons had been changed, and where now in the heaven are placed the north wind and winter, there was the station of the south wind and of the midday, and where now is placed the south wind, there was the north. If this had been so, the sun being driven from the midst of the heaven by the winter and the north wind would go to the upper parts of Europe, just as now he comes to the upper parts of Libya. And passing in his course throughout the whole of Europe, I suppose he would do to the Ister that which he now works upon the Nile. As to the breeze, why none blows from the river, my opinion is that from very hot places it is not natural that anything should blow, and that a breeze is wont to blow from something cold. Of the Nile, then, let so much suffice as has been said. Of Egypt, however, I shall make my report at length, because it has wonders more in number than any other land, and works, too, it has to show as much as any land, which are beyond expression great. For this reason, then, more shall be said concerning it. The Egyptians, in agreement with their climate, which is unlike any other, and with the river, which shows a nature different from all other rivers, established for themselves manners and customs in a way opposite to other men, in almost all matters. For among them the women frequent the market and carry on trade, while the men remain at home and weave. And whereas others weave pushing the woof upwards, the Egyptians push it downwards. The men carry their burdens upon their heads, and the women upon their shoulders. The women make water standing up, and the men crouching down. They ease themselves in their houses, and they eat without in the streets, alleging as reason for this, that it is right to do secretly the things that are unseemly, though necessary, but those which are not unseemly in public. No woman is a minister either of male or female divinity, but men of all, both male and female. To support their parents, the sons are in no way compelled if they do not desire to do so. But the daughters are forced to do so, be they never so unwilling. The priests of the gods in other lands wear long hair, but in Egypt they shave their heads. Among other men, the custom is that in mourning, those whom the matter concerns most nearly have their hair cut short. But the Egyptians, when deaths occur, let their hair grow long, both that on the head and that on the chin, having before been close-shaven. Other men have their daily living separated from beasts, but the Egyptians have theirs together with beasts. Other men live on wheat and on barley, but to any one of the Egyptians who makes his living on these it is a great reproach. They make their bread of maize, which some call spelt. They knead dough with their feet and clay with their hands, with which also they gather up dung. And whereas other men, except such as have learnt otherwise from the Egyptians, have their members as nature made them, the Egyptians practice circumcision. As to garments, the men wear two each, and the women but one. And whereas others make fast the rings and ropes of the sails outside the ship, the Egyptians do this inside. Finally, in the writing of characters and reckoning with pebbles, 
while the Hellenes carry the hand from the left to the right, the Egyptians do this from the right to the left, and doing so, they say that they do it themselves rightwise and the Hellenes leftwise. And they use two kinds of characters for writing, of which the one kind is called sacred and the other common. They are religious excessively beyond all other men, and with regard to this they have customs as follows. They drink from cups of bronze and rinse them out every day, and not some only do this, but all. They wear garments of linen, always newly washed, and this they make a special point of practice. They circumcise themselves for the sake of cleanliness, preferring to be clean rather than comely. The priests shave themselves all over their body every other day, so that no lice or any other foul thing may come to be upon them when they minister to the gods. And the priests wear garments of linen only and sandals of papyrus and any other garment they may not take, nor other sandals. They wash themselves in cold water twice in a day, and twice again in the night, and other religious services they perform, one may almost say, of infinite number. They enjoy also good things not a few, for they do not consume or spend anything of their own substance but there is sacred bread baked for them, and they have each great quantity of flesh of oxen and geese coming into them each day, and also wine of grapes is given to them. But it is not permitted to them to taste of fish. Beans, moreover, the Egyptians do not at all sow in their land and those which they grow they neither eat raw nor boil for food. Nay, the priests do not endure even to look upon them, thinking this to be an unclean kind of pulse. And there is not one priest only for each of the gods, but many, and of them one is chief priest, and whenever a priest dies, his son is appointed in his place. Egypt, though it borders upon Libya, does not very much abound in wild animals, but such as they have are one and all accounted by them sacred, some of them living with men and others not. But if I should say for what reasons the sacred animals have been thus dedicated, I should fall into discourse of matters pertaining to the gods, of which I most desire not to speak. And what I have actually said touching slightly upon them, I said because I was constrained by necessity. About these animals there is a custom of this kind. Persons have been appointed of the Egyptians, both men and women, to provide the food for each kind of beast separately, and their office goes down from father to son, and those who dwell in the various cities perform vows to them thus, that is, when they make a vow to the god to whom the animal belongs, they shave the head of their children, either the whole or the half or the third part of it, and then set the hair in the balance against silver, and whatever it weighs, this the man gives to the person who provides for the animals, and she cuts up fish of equal value and gives it for food to the animals. Thus food for their support has been appointed, and if anyone kill any of these animals, the penalty, if he do it with his own will, is death, and if against his will, such penalty as the priests may appoint. But whosoever shall kill an ibis or a hawk, 
whether it be with his will or against his will, must die. Of the animals that live with men, there are great numbers, and would be many more but for the accidents which befall the cats. For when the females have produced young, they are no longer in the habit of going to the males, and these, seeking to be united with them, are not able. To this end, then, they contrive as follows. They either take away by force or remove secretly the young from the females and kill them, but after killing, they do not eat them. And the females, being deprived of their young and desiring more, therefore come to the males, for it is a creature that is fond of its young. Moreover, when a fire occurs, the cats seem to be divinely possessed, for while the Egyptians stand at intervals and look after the cats, not taking any care to extinguish the fire, the cats slipping through or leaping over the men jump into the fire. And when this happens, great mourning comes upon the Egyptians. And in whatever houses a cat has died by a natural death, all those who dwell in this house shave their eyebrows only. But those in which a dog has died shave their whole body and also their head. The cats, when they are dead, are carried away to sacred buildings in the city of Bubastis, where after being embalmed, they are buried. But the dogs, they bury each people in their own city in sacred tombs, and the ichnomans are buried just in the same way as the dogs. The shrew mice, however, and the hawks they carry away to the city of Buto, and the ibises to Hermopolis. The bears, which are not commonly seen, and the wolves, not much larger in size than foxes, they bury on the spot where they are found lying. Of the crocodile, the nature is as follows. During the four most wintry months, this creature eats nothing. She has four feet and is an animal belonging to the land and the water both, for she produces and hatches eggs on the land, and the most part of the day she remains upon dry land, but the whole of the night in the river, for the water in truth is warmer than the unclouded open air and the dew. Of all the mortal creatures of which we have knowledge, this grows to the greatest bulk from the smallest beginning. For the eggs which she produces are not much larger than those of geese, and the newly hatched young one is in proportion to the egg. But as he grows, he becomes as much as seventeen cubits long, and sometimes yet larger. He has eyes like those of a pig, and teeth large and tusky, in proportion to the size of his body. But unlike all other beasts, he grows no tongue. Neither does he move his lower jaw, but brings the upper jaw toward the lower, being in this too unlike all other beasts. He has, moreover, strong claws and a scaly hide upon his back, which cannot be pierced. And he is blind in the water, but in the air he is of a very keen sight. Since he has his living in the water, he keeps his mouth all full within of leeches. And whereas all other birds and beasts fly from him, the Trochilus is a creature which is at peace with him, seeing that from her he receives benefit. For the crocodile, having come out of the water to the land, and then having opened his mouth, which he is wont to do generally toward the west wind, the Trochilus upon that enters into his mouth and swallows down the leeches. 
and he, being benefited, is pleased and does no harm to the Trochilus. Now, for some of the Egyptians, the crocodiles are sacred animals, and for others, not so, but they treat them, on the contrary, as enemies. Those, however, who dwell about Thebes and about the lake of Moiris hold them to be most sacred. And each of these two peoples keeps one crocodile selected from the whole number, which has been trained to tameness. And they put hanging ornaments of molten stone and of gold into the ears of these, and anklets round the front feet, and they give them food appointed and victims of sacrifices, and treat them as well as possible while they live. And after they are dead, they bury them in sacred tombs, embalming them. But those who dwell about the city of Elephantine even eat them, not holding them to be sacred. They are called not crocodiles, but chompsai, and the Ionians gave them the name of crocodile, comparing their form to that of the crocodiles or lizards which appear in their country in the stone walls. There are many ways in use of catching them, and of various kinds. I shall describe that which to me seems the most worthy of being told. A man puts the back of a pig upon a hook as bait, and lets it go into the middle of the river, while he himself upon the bank of the river has a young live pig, which he beats. And the crocodile, hearing its cries, makes for the direction of the sound. And when he finds the pig's back, he swallows it down. Then they pull, and when he is drawn out to land, first of all, the hunter forthwith plasters up his eyes with mud. And having done so, he very easily gets the mastery of him. But if he does not do so, he has much trouble. The river horse is sacred in the district of Papremis, but for the other Egyptians he is not sacred, and this is the appearance which he presents. He is four-footed, cloven-hoofed like an ox, flat-nosed with a mane like a horse and showing teeth like tusks, with a tail and voice like a horse and in size as large as the largest ox. And his hide is so exceedingly thick that when it has been dried, shafts of javelins are made of it. There are, moreover, otters in the river, which they consider to be sacred. And of fish also they esteem that which is called the lepidotos to be sacred, and also the eel. And these, they say, are sacred to the Nile, and of birds, the fox goose. There is also another sacred bird, called the phoenix, which I did not myself see except in painting, for in truth he comes to them very rarely, at intervals, as the people of Heliopolis say, of five hundred years. And these say that he comes regularly when his father dies. And if he be like the painting, he is of this size and nature. That is to say, some of his feathers are of gold color, and others red. And in outline and size, he has as nearly as possible like an eagle. This bird, they say, but I cannot believe the story contrives as follows. Setting forth from Arabia, he conveys his father, they say, to the temple of the sun, or Helios, plastered up in myrrh, and buries him in the temple of the sun, and he conveys him thus. He forms first an egg of myrrh, as large as he is able to carry, 
and then he makes trial of carrying it. And when he has made trial sufficiently, then he hollows out the egg and places his father within it, and plasters over it with other myrrh, that part of the egg where he hollowed it out to put his father in. And when his father is laid in it, it proves, they say, to be of the same weight as it was, and after he has plastered it up, he conveys the whole to Egypt, to the Temple of the Sun. Thus they say that this bird does. And that seems as good a place as any to end this evening's reading from an account of Egypt by the Western world's first known historian, Herodotus. There's a lot more left in this book, and frankly, I skipped over more than a few pages about geography. So if you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or send me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. I always love hearing from you. I'm so glad you could join me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.